Hey y'all, welcome to part 9 of my series on the Vectric software titles for the absolute beginner. Before we get started, let me state that I am neither sponsored nor endorsed by Vectric Limited nor any other company I may talk about in this video to include bit manufacturers or retailers. I'm doing this series to help the person who has never done anything like this before get into their software, start and finish a project within that software. Now for those of you who are Vectric users, I'm using VCarve Pro version 9.510, but everything I'm going to show you works identically in Cut 2D Desktop and Pro, VCarve Desktop and Pro, and Aspire. Now I've had quite a few questions on how to add a new tool or a new end mill to the tool database within the Vectric software. So I'm going to demonstrate some of the ways of doing that today. Before we can do anything, we need to start a project. If we look up here at our menu bar, we only have File, Gadgets, and Help available to us unless we have a project open down here. Those of you using the desktop versions don't even have gadgets because gadgets are not supported. So let's go ahead and create a new file and Whatever is in here, I'm going to go ahead and just accept because we won't actually be using this. We just have to have a file open in order to have full access to our menu bar up here. So whatever is in here, I'll just go ahead and click OK. So we have a project open. Now we have access to our menu bar up above here. The way to get into the tool database without going over to the Toolpaths tab is to go up here to the Toolpath menu and click on Tool Database and that opens our Tool Database here. I work with Imperial measurements on everything so my database opens up to Imperial tools. If you're using metric that's located down here and but the directions for adding a new tool are identical just you'll be using metric measurements you can see I have a lot of end mills added and I have a few ball nose bits added and a few V bits added in here the absolute easiest way to add a new bit is to find a bit that is similar to the one you want to add that's already in the database for instance, for this example, let's say I went out and I got a new end mill that is 3 8 cutting diameter instead of quarter inch or half inch. So I would want to add it somewhere between these two bits here. The easiest way to do this would be just to copy a bit that's already existing in the database and change the measurements. So we'll do that first. I'll go ahead and select my quarter inch bit and it opens up the tool info over here to the side. And then I'm going to come down here and click this button that says copy right here. Now when I click that button, watch what happens up here. I'll click on copy and it added a second copy of this quarter inch end mill. You can see all the information is identical. So what I need to do now is I'm going to select this one here between half inch and quarter inch. I'll select this one here and this is the one I'm going to edit. I'm going to change this one for my new bit. Again, as I said, it's a 3 8 inch cutting diameter bit. So I'll need to go up here and I'm going to change the name of it. And I happen to remember that the decimal equivalent of 3 8 inch is point 375. So I've changed the title right off the bat. 
it is an end mill. And down here I have this blank for notes, where I can put in the bit manufacturer, the bit part number, maybe a link to a website where I ordered it from. I can put any information in here. These are just notes for me. Now we'll get into the geometry of the bit. And the important information we need here is, if we look at the diagram, D is for the diameter. We need the cutting diameter, not the shank diameter. That doesn't matter. We need the cutting diameter. And in this case, again, it's 0.375. Now, when I entered 0.375 here, it changed the measurement down here on the step over. We'll get into that in just a minute. So I have my cutting diameter entered here. Now we'll move down into the cutting parameters. And the first one is the pass depth. And that is the depth of cut, how deep this bit is going to plunge into the material and cut per pass. Now, here's where I find a little bit of controversy. Some people like to push their bits harder than I push mine. The way I was taught was to enter as a pass depth, one half of the tool's cutting diameter. Now, you may have a differing opinion. You may have a different experience. Your mileage may vary. You may want to go ahead and use the cutting diameter as your pass depth. Personally, I tend to run more conservatively. I run half the cutting diameter as my pass depth. And again, remember, this is maximum. We can always go back and edit it later on. So I'm going to enter half of my bit's cutting diameter. And I don't remember off the top of my head what that is. So again, I'll use the calculators that are built in to Vectrix software. So I'll highlight everything in there. Tap backspace to clear it. And I'll type the cutting diameter, in this case 0.375 divided by, it's the front slash, 2. Then when I tap the equals button on my keyboard, it does the calculation for me, and there is one half of my bit's cutting diameter entered in the proper blank. Now for my step over, it is recommended that you use less than 50%. Now, on a 3 8 inch cutting diameter, that's a pretty large bit, I can go a little more than 40%. In fact, I'm going to bump it up to 45%. Now, it doesn't want to do, we'll go 45%. Okay, and that made our step over 0 0.1688. Again, that's the maximum step over. That's for clearing out a pocket or if we use it for a flat area clearance tool in a V-carve tool path. It will step over a maximum of 0.1688 inches. If it doesn't need to step over that much to finish up a pocket, it'll just step over however much it needs to step over. Now we get down in here into the real controversial section. And that is feeds and speeds. For the spindle speed, my, on my CNC, I'm using a Porter Cable Model 890 series router motor. It's variable speed that is controlled on the router. My software does not control the speed of my router. So I leave this blank alone. It's irrelevant to me because I could enter 100,000 RPM. It wouldn't change anything the speed is controlled on the router itself. If you have a water air-cooled or water-cooled spindle, you would want to consult the bit manufacturer. Usually they have recommendations as to how fast you should run the bit and the feed rate based on the chip load of the bit. Personally, I run conservative and I've had good luck doing that, but I don't 
do anything with the router RPM simply because my router is not controlled by software. For the feed rate, again, this is going to spark some controversy. I run conservative. My controller software out on my machine is Mach 3. And Mach 3 allows me to adjust my feed rate on the fly as the bit is cutting the material. So if I start conservative with a conservative number like 40 inches per minute, I can bump that up up to 300 percent. So I could bump this up to 120 inches per minute as it's cutting and I see how it's cutting. So I'll bump it up a little bit if I can until I start to get a little bit of chatter then I'll back it back down until that chatter goes away. That's the way I was taught to figure out how fast to run a bit. Now again, your mileage may vary. And do be aware that any feed and speed recommendations made by manufacturers are based on industrial machines, not home hobby CNC machines. Your machine may or may not be rigid enough to handle the feeds and speeds that the manufacturer recommends based on the chip load of the bit. It's that's when it's time to do some experimentation. I find that by starting conservative with a feed rate of 40 inches per minute, I can adjust on the fly as the tool is cutting the material. And it's worked fine for me. I have never broken a bit cutting the material. I've broken them in other ways, but not cutting the material. For the plunge rate, the plunge rate I enter is half of the feed rate. So in this case I have a feed rate of 40 inches per minute and a plunge rate of 20 inches per minute. The tool number, in this case it's irrelevant. You will change this as you calculate tool paths. So I don't bother with anything right here, right now. We have the information we need to go ahead and enter this tool into our database. Now if you look over here, we still have a quarter inch end mill and a quarter inch end mill, then a half inch end mill. The minute I come over here and I click apply, that changes. It's taken all of the settings that I've entered here and applied it to that end mill. So I now have the half inch, the three eighths, the quarter. That is the easiest way to add a new tool, is to copy one that you already have entered in the database and change the dimensions to match the tool that you have, that you've purchased. And the same thing holds true whether it's a ball nose or a V-bit. They're all done in exactly the same way. If, for instance, you bought a 30 degree V-bit that has a quarter inch cutting capacity, you would copy it, then change the name, enter any notes you wish to enter, then change the settings over here. I tend to leave the step over percentages as they are. They work fine for me. So the main thing I would change on this bit if I bought a quarter inch end mill, a quarter inch cutting diameter 30 degree bit, I would change the diameter, leave the angle alone, and then change the pass depth, feed and speed. The next way to add a bit is to see if the bit manufacturer has created any files that will help you enter a profile. We want to add a new bit to the tool database we want to add a special one. We're not going to add an end mill or a ball nose or a v-bit or anything that's already entered in here. What I want to add is a tapered ball nose end mill for 3D carving. So one of the manufacturers that is leading the way on this 
is Amana Tools. Now, I know Amana Tools are a little bit pricey, but they've done a few things to help folks with Vectric software to enter the information from their bits into the software. And to be honest, whether you buy an Amana tool or not, this information can be modified to suit your bit. Let me show you what I'm talking about here. I'm looking for a tapered ball nose for 3D carving that has a 16th inch tip diameter. So I've gone to the Tools Today website and I'll put a link in the description box below for this. And I'm going to select a 16th inch bit. And what that's done is that's narrowed my choices down here. I want to remember that I'm cutting wood so I want a two flute bit. And that narrowed my choices down to two bits. If we look at these very closely and very carefully, the only difference between these two bits is its overall length. This one is two and a quarter inches long. This one is two and twenty-three sixty-fourths long. So not quite two and a half. I'll go ahead and I'll check this one here. This is part number 46252. The important things to look at on this bit are, in this picture right here, the shank diameter, the overall length, the cutting depth, the cutting edge length, the tip diameter, the tip radius, and the angle of the bit. And all that is spelled out right here. Now, one of the reasons that I chose this bit is because Amana is leading the way in doing something to help folks get their bit information entered into the Vectric software. Now, if we look down here below, we see the Overview tab right here. We see another tab for PDF files, video, reviews, Q&A, Proposition 65, warning for those of you in California. Some of their bits have another tab over here that says Vectric. Some of them don't have this, like this one here. If you click that Vectric tab, or if you click this tab here for PDF files, you come down here and you see there's the chip load, feed and speed chart for this bit. Here's the specification sheet for this bit. Here's an AutoCAD DXF tool file for this bit. And a PDF file for this bit. But if you scroll down a little bit more, here's a Vectric tool file. Again, we look up here. The part number is 46252. They don't have the tool file specifically for this bit. But they have one that is similar enough that we can use it. So we'll go ahead and we'll click I've already checked it out. 46282 is very similar. We'll click this and it opens up the save window. And we have a tool file for this particular bit. Now I'll go ahead and navigate to the folder I want to save this in. I'm going to go ahead and put it in this folder. Click Save. Now I want to keep this website open because I'll still need some of the information here. Now when I go down here to vCarve Pro, I want to import this bit and this bit's information into the database. So I'll go ahead and I'll click Import and 
navigate to the folder I downloaded that file to and there it is right there. Select it, click open. Now it's asking me if I want to merge databases or import this under the selected tool. I want to import it. This is not a whole database, it's just the information on one tool. So you don't want to merge it, you just want to import it. Click No to import. And now we see what, when it imported, it created a new group up here, titled New Group. We click on the plus sign, and there is the tool data for the bit that is similar to the one we bought. Now remember, we purchased this tool, which has a 5.5 degree angle where the other tool has a 5.4 degree angle. So that's one of the things we'll need to change. We'll get into that in just a second. First thing we'll talk about, it's added the name of this bit, the part number, tapered ball nose, and then the angle of the tip, the cutting diameter, and the tip diameter. So what I want to do just for me to make this easier for me to keep track of is I want to highlight that part number, hold down the control button, tap the letter X. That cuts it out of that title. I'll then come down here to the notes section and type Amana tool. Then I will add the part number from the tool we purchased, 46252. Number 46252. That tells me which bit this is without cluttering up the title. Now I'll need to go ahead and change this title to reflect the actual dimensions of the bit. It doesn't have a 5.4 degree angle. It has a 5.5 degree angle. The tip is 1 16th of an inch diameter, 0 0.0625, and it is a quarter inch cutting diameter. So again, keeping that in mind, we have a quarter inch diameter for our geometry. That's the cutting diameter. We have a 5.5 degree angle. We have a tip radius of a sixteenth of an inch. Vectric and Amana have rounded that up to 0.313. I will change that. 0.3125. It may round up from here on its own. It may not. It entered the cutting length of the bit here in pass depth. Now you can choose to keep that there if you wish. Personally, I don't like to use that as a pass depth. Again, I want to use one half of the cutting diameter in this case a quarter of an inch. I'm going to use an eighth of an inch, 0 0.125. The rest of these can remain the same. For the step over, it's using the percentage of the tip diameter, not the cutting diameter. The step over in this case, 4%, that would be a finishing pass step over. 4% is a little small. That makes for a long machine time. I generally bounce back and forth, depending upon the material, between 8 and 9%. So for right now, I'll enter 8.0%, and that automatically changed my step over to 5 thousandths of an inch. Now, it's something to keep in mind. 
it's only stepping over five thousandths of an inch. If you have a large file, that's going to make for a long cutting time. The clearance pass step over, they recommend 47.9%. So long as it's under 50%, I'm happy. I'm going to change this to 45%, however. And that's just for me. Now, we, again, this is for the clearance pass. This would be a 3D roughing pass if you decide to use this bit for 3D roughing. Again, controversial here. They, Amana recommends spindle speed of 18,000 RPM. Again, my spindle isn't controlled by the software, so that's fine. They recommend a feed rate of 30 inches per minute and a plunge rate of 15. I'm going to go ahead and accept that and we'll see how it works when I start cutting. I may bump this up. I may have to bump it back down. It just depends on the material and the project that it's cutting. From here, I can click Apply and we see that tapered ball nose bit has changed with a 5.5 degree angle and a tip radius of one sixteenth of an inch and a cutting diameter of a quarter inch. We can choose to keep this tool here in new group. We can move it down with our ball noses or we can change the name of this group to tapered ball nose and hit enter. Then from now on any tapered ball noses I get I can enter them in here in this group and Vectric will keep track of it for me. I hope that didn't cause a lot of confusion but that's the way you can enter a similar tool from the Amana website using their Vectric tool database files to import bit information into the tool database. And to be honest, it doesn't necessarily have to be an Amana tool. If you use that tool database file from Amana, so long as you have the angle the tip diameter, the tip radius, and the cutting diameter. In this case, a quarter of an inch. As long as you have those measurements, you can enter any bit from any manufacturer using that tool database file. The final method I'm going to show you is simply by adding a new tool. And we'll, for this, we'll go to Tool Paths tool database and down here we have new. I click on that button. The tool info doesn't know what we want to do. So we'll have to choose a tool type, be that ball nose, end mill, v-bit, tapered ball nose, whichever. Most of the more oddball tools that we would want to enter into the database fall under the category of form tools. Now let me give you an example. A uh, cutting point roundover bit. That's a roundover bit that can be plunged straight down into the material. It does not have a guide bearing on it. So what I would do is I would select form tool and we see here I get an error already. It says a single open vector representing the right side of the tool profile must be selected to define the tool geometry. The vector must only represent the right hand edge of the tool. Do not include the top face of the tool profile. So we'll click OK and cancel. Yes, I want to close. What it's telling us is we need a vector. We need to draw a vector out here that represents the right hand side of that tool's profile. Now there's a couple of ways we can do that. We can draw the tool profile here ourselves freehand 
we can download a picture of the bit that we're trying to copy and do a bitmap trace. Or we can use another little cheat, and that is use legacy CNC's DXF file. Now, legacy CNC has teamed up with Magnate router bits, and I'll put a link to this page in the description box below. They have created a DXF file that has the bit profiles of some of their more popular bits for use with a CNC. And the file that we're looking at is this one right here, router bit profiles .dxf. So I have already downloaded this to my computer, but the way you would do it is click on the link, give it a title, navigate to the folder you want to save it into, and then click Save. And as I say, I've already done so, so that's why it's already here. So I will cancel this. You would save it to your computer. With that file downloaded, what I would do here in vCarve is go to File, Import, Vectors and navigate to the folder I downloaded that DXF file to. There it is right there. I'll select it, click Open, let it load. Once it's loaded, I can zoom out, and there is a DXF representation of the router bits that Magnate has provided to Legacy CNC. Now, I mentioned a plunge point roundover bit. That bit has this profile right here, allowing it to plunge straight down into a piece of material and round over a profile or create beads or something to that effect. Now, I already have a plunge point roundover here, but I would like to add this 3 16 bit. I already have the 8th inch. I'd like to add the one with the 3 16 radius. And that's model number 7504. Again, it's Magnate router bits. So if I go to magnate.net and enter that model number 7504 in the search box here, it brings up this bit, which is a two flute carbide tipped plunge point roundover bit. And that's what I want to enter in my tool database. So, remembering it's got a 3 16 radius, with a 3 16 radius here, that's going to give us a cutting diameter of 3 8 of an inch. So we need to keep that in mind. Okay? So what I'll do is I'll go back into vCarve, and I will select that profile. Now you see it's giving us both sides of the profile. We only want the right side. So we're going to have to do a little bit of modification. Before we do that, let's get it moved over into the center of our material so we can modify it and then enter this bit into the database. So with it selected, I'll, on my keyboard, hold down Control, type the letter C to copy, then immediately hold down Control, type the letter V to paste. So it pasted that copy right over the top of the right over the top of the profile that was already there. Now from here, I'll go over to Align Selected Objects, and I'll align that vector to the material. I want it in the center of our project material. Click on that and it disappears. Now I can close this, then go up here to zoom active view to the selected objects and that zooms us into our material where that profile sits. Now I need to get rid of the left side representation of, of this vector. I only want the right side. 
So I'm going to go into node editing mode and split this vector in half. And I'll do that by typing the letter N on my keyboard. And that brings us into node editing mode. You'll see how my cursor arrow is changed just to the point of an arrow. Here we have this bright green node here, node or point. That indicates our starting point. Down here is another point, and up here is an end point. So what I'll do is I'll come down here, put my cursor over this point here in the center, right click, and click on Cut Vector. What I've just done is I've separated this, so now I have this vector here and this vector here. They are now separate. Still in noted editing, with this selected, I can hit the delete key, and that side is gone. Type the letter N again to get, come out of node editing mode, and I now have the vector that represents the right side of my new bit. So I'll select that vector, go back up here to Tool Paths, Tool Database, Again, come down to New. For the tool type, I'll go into Form Tools. And we now see the profile of the bit that we want to enter into our database. We'll start at the top and we'll enter the information and our cutting parameters. The first thing is the name of the tool. I want to make sure I remember this is a point cutting roundover bit with a 3 16th diameter. Up here it says 375. That's 3 8 diameter. That is the total cutting diameter. I need to know that this is a 3 16th roundover. So I will change, I'll get rid of the form tool name, I will enter 3 sixteenths is point one eight seven five radius Point three seven five diameter plunge point round over. Now that's a long title, I understand that, but we know we have the three sixteenths radius, three eighths inch cutting diameter, plunge point round over. Now for here, from here, we'll come down to the geometry. The cutting diameter from here to here is 3 eighths of an inch. Our pass depth, we want our pass depth to be 3 sixteenths of an inch. We don't want it to go any deeper than that. So we'll enter here, 1 eight, seven, five. Our step over, I have yet to use a step over with a round over bit. I'll leave this be. I won't use it. The feed rate and plunge rate, I'm going to leave the same as an as the end mill, as an end mill of comparable size size. I'll leave it at forty inches per minute with a twenty inch per minute plunge rate. Click apply and up here now we see it's give, added a our tool under Imperial Tools. Now I want to move this down into the Form Tools where I already have an eighth inch radius point bit. So I'll go ahead and I'll close up these other folders just so I can get to it. And I have 
here is the bit that we just added. I want to just drag it down into the Form Tools folder and drop it. And now you see I have one 1 8 inch radius and a 3 16 radius roundover, plunge point roundover bit. Click OK and those that bit is entered into my tool database. You'll notice some very strange combinations here, some strange shapes and what have you, but be very careful. I'll do a simple one up here and show you on the dovetail bit, for example. These dovetail bits have a 14 degree angle to the outside. This is not like a V bit. This tapers to the outside. That creates an undercut meaning this corner of the bit is going to cut in to the material further than the top corner of the bit. That's an undercut. Vectric software will not recognize any bit that cuts, that creates an undercut. The way you would use a dovetail bit would be to use the dovetail gadget or kind of cheat the system and trick it into thinking it's just a standard end mill. More on that in another video. But do know that if you select the right side of a dovetail bit and try to enter it as a form tool or any other tool, it will not accept it. You will get an, you will get an error that says a suitable vector has not been selected. It will not let you add any tool that creates an undercut. The same holds true for a keyhole bit. A keyhole bit creates an undercut and will not allow you to uh, enter it into the tool database. Certain bits like uh, crown molding tools, they can be added just fine. Beading tools, cove and bead tools, they can be added as well. Just remember you need the right side of the vector, the vector representing the right side of the profile. For instance, on this particular bit, you would need to copy, paste, move this over onto the material, then cut this vector in half, then join these together into one vector before you uh, do your, you import your new tool. Between this DXF file and the Amana tool database that allows you to add tool profiles, it would be very easy to go in and just start downloading tool profiles, tool profiles left and right. I'd like to caution you against doing that. Enter those tools as you buy the tools. I mean, let's think about it. Why would you have a tool in your database that you don't physically own? You're just going to confuse matters by doing that. Just know that if you should buy a tool, you can find the various ways to get that tool entered into the database, whether you copy an existing tool you use a tool database file from a Mana tool or any other manufacturer, or you draw the profile in yourself and then enter the criteria, the cutting parameters, feed speeds, etc. Well, I hope that didn't confuse matters, and I hope you got something out of this video. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them down in the comment section. If you'd rather not leave a public comment, as usual, head over here to my website, marklindsaycnc.com, and click that Contact Us link. Then you can send me any message you'd like. I do read every message I get through the Contact Us link at marklindsaycnc.com, and I do my best to answer each and every one of them. MarkLindsayCNC.com 
is sponsored by Harneal Media. They are the web design and web hosting company that specializes in websites and web hosting for makers and the maker community. We are also both proud members of the Makers Media Network. So that's going to wrap up this episode. Once again, don't be afraid to ask any questions that you may have. You are probably not the only person with that question. If you got anything at all out of this video, I would sure appreciate a thumbs up down below. And if you know of another person who could benefit from watching this video, by all means share it on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all of your social media. I do appreciate all of the comments, the thumbs up, and the shares that I get. I really appreciate it. If you'd like to follow along with this series, or if you'd like to check out some of my other CNC adventures, I do hope you'll subscribe to my channel. But, as usual, whether you subscribe to my channel or not, I'd like to thank you very much for watching, and y'all take care.